Well, this summer we're taking the time to go through a series called Sanct on how to abide with God. And, and remember that uh, our primary scripture for this is from John 15, the passage about abiding in Christ, that uh, we are the branches, he is the vine. And so the question that we're answering is, how do we do this? How do we abide with him? How do we remain in him? How do we stay put in him, stay synced in him? And what we're using for this is actually some biology, although I'm pretty weak in that. And biology says that anything or everything that is alive, that there are seven uh, principles, seven things that every uh, live organism, every, every uh, animal, everything that's alive has. And they, we're, we're learning that we can use these to kind of assess our own spiritual life and assess how to stay, uh, how to remain in Him. And uh, the biology says that it's respiration and it's nutrition, sensitivity and movement and growth, reproduction, and excretion and today we've got sensitivity and the definition of sensitivity is awareness of internal and external stimuli now the, the body is integrated it works together and sensitivity plays just a really vital role in us being receptive to stimuli so the question is, are we receptive to, to God's stimuli to us? Are, are we uh, sensitive, you know, with reflection and, and soft hearts and humility? And do we have a sensory system, a spiritual sensory system through which we can receive from God the messages that he is trying to give us? Okay, uh, to, to use Jesus's illustration, is the sap running from the branch into the vine? And do we hear and see and feel and taste and even smell the things of God? You know, I was thinking about this, and all of those references to the five senses are used in Scripture metaphorically. You know, we, um, we, we hear God's voice. Uh, we see God. We see God at work. Uh, there are many references to God touching someone, you know, and perhaps in a vision or metaphorically that, that God reached out to me, God touched me. I think of how the psalmist said that, he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then the last one the, uh, of smelling, um, the prayers of the people of God are a sweet smelling aroma to God. So I, I think we can say with certainty that, that, that some people have a more advanced sensory system. And, and in the physical way, we know that to be true. Like if someone really has a keen olfactory system, they really can smell things. And, you know, they, they know what's going on sometimes before anybody else does. And, and that's good and that's bad. You know, the, the world might smell really good to them or, or they might be in a restaurant and there might be some, some smells that are coming out of the back room that kind of ruin dinner for you. But uh, in the same way, uh, people, some people are very spiritually sensitive to what God is uh, telling them. And it's a, it's a gift from God, a particular gift from Him for the body of Christ. And Ephesians 4, 11 to 2, Paul mentions this. Uh, he said, And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. One of those in there was the prophet, you see. And the prophet has an increased sensory system they're able to hear and to discern what God is saying and, and that's a gift from him and uh, prophets hear God more clearly and I'm, I'm not gifted in that and uh, it it took me a while to kind of accept that that I'm not gifted you know to hear things from God like some other people but but that doesn't mean that I don't uh, get the advantage of that gift because I identify people who do have that gift and I listen to what God tells them when they say I think the Lord wants us to do this I say okay you know 
they, they have that gift and need to pay attention. Now, sensitivity seldom stays the same. You know, what, what I've learned is that as we age, as time goes by, this ability from, to hear God, to, to see what he's doing, to discern his will, you know, it, it either, either increases or it decreases, but seldom is it static. Seldom does it stay the same. And we're, we're either growing and we're receiving, or we becoming more and more apathetic and insensitive to the Holy Spirit as time goes by. And I guess today what I really want to make sure is that we understand that and that, that we own that. As we age, we begin to lose our physical senses. It's just a part of life. Uh, granted, our, our noses and our ears never cease to grow. I mean, stop and think about that for a while. You know, that as you get older, your ears are going to continue to grow and your nose is going to continue to grow. But they are not going to work as well as what they do probably today. And uh, I remember one time an older lady who was you know, in her upper 80s or early 90s, and she told me that she could hardly hear anything with her ears. She was really deaf, you know, but her inner ear, her, her spiritual ear of being able to hear with God, she says, I'm hearing him much better today. That still small voice. So as one decreased, the other increased, and hopefully that's our experience as well. That doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes, or well, really often, people hear God and they respond and then they slowly lose their desire and their ability to hear His voice and their senses begin to get dull. And I ask you just to um, listen with me, to bear with me a few minutes as we cover the negative side of this subject, the loss of our spiritual senses, before we get to the more proactive, positive side. The, the Bible speaks of the heart as being the core of a person. It's not about our emotions like the world says. You know, if someone has a, has a big heart, it means they're emotional. And no, it's the, the Bible is the core of the person, the real person, and there are instances in both testaments of people who saw great things that God had done. They saw miracles and they saw the glory of God. And yet as time went by, they lost their ability to hear and to see what he was doing and to be sensitive, to have a sensitive heart towards him because as the Bible said, they developed a hard heart. It's, it's really complex, really, really sad thing. I mean, we, we have trouble making sense of this because it seems to be impossible that people who were chosen by God, I mean, given his covenant rights, given his great blessings, saw things that we would, you know, really long to see. And then after that, their ability to hear him and to see him and understand things, uh, to, to be sensitive to his spirit diminishes with time. And they get so they just don't care anymore. A heart that once was soft and easily affected by God's uh, messages to them becomes calloused and hard and they stop seeing what God was doing and they stopped hearing. Now I thought of this in, in the book of Hebrews and the New Testament. Uh, three times the writer says, do not harden your hearts. Three times. He says, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. The first one is Hebrews 3.8. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. And then just a little bit later, seven verses later, he repeats that again in 3.15. He says, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And then in the next chapter in 4.7, he says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And we kind of sense the, the danger to this New Testament church, this group of people, as the writer is saying, watch out, be careful. Don't harden your hearts like them. Evidently, that was a possibility. He was saying, you can become apathetic. You can become indifferent. 
Now, the, the incident that Hebrews is referring to here is actually first cited by uh, David in one of his psalms. It's, he's actually referencing Psalm 95.8. So we go from New Testament Hebrews back to Psalm 95.8. And the psalms written by David, and, and you remember David, David had an epic fail, an epic fail in life. Adultery first and then murder. And, and when God confronted David through the prophet Nathan with his sin that he was hiding, David broke. His heart was not hard towards God. David's heart just broke over what he had done. And he was anything but indifferent. And so he wrote a song about his repentance uh, towards God. And it's, it's a beautiful psalm. You've heard it before, Psalm 51. And in this psalm, he says, God, God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You hear the heart of David there. He'd done a terrible thing. And yet he writes this song for all the people of Israel to sing. That's what the Psalms are. This would be one of the songs that they would sing as they were going to worship, you know, or, or perhaps as they had had an epic fail. But the incident that David is referring to <laughs> happened earlier to the people of Israel. It's back in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. Uh, the people of Israel had been delivered from the wilderness, or excuse me, they had been delivered from Egypt and they had gone through the Red Sea. You all know that story. And then they, they see the Egyptian army and that the Egyptian army gets swallowed up by waves. And, and they have this great time of re rejoicing. But just, you know, a few days later, they, they end up at this oasis and they're out there in the Sinai desert and they end up at this oasis where, you know, there's always a spring of water there and the spring of water's dried up. And they don't have anything, and there's there's a lot of them, you know. And so they start just you know, really complaining to Moses, and they go, I, we should have died back in Egypt. We told you not to bring us out here. You know, we don't want to come. You made us come. We don't want to come out here. And in other words, what they're saying is that we wish we would never have heard of you, Yahweh. We wish we didn't know you. And that incident stood as an example of people who had received this great blessing where God had miraculously taken them out of bondage and they had walked through the Red Sea on dry ground and yet soon after that, their hearts are so hard towards God. You see, that they go, we don't want any more. Just leave us alone. And the writer of the Hebrew says, be careful. Be very cautious. Don't let your hearts get hard. It's within your power to keep them tender, to be sensitive to the Spirit. Now, I'm confident that had we asked those Hebrew people if their hearts were hard, they would say, us? <laughs> Not us, no. Man, we're Yahweh's peeps. Man, we've, we've been with him through everything we we went through the through the red sea and we eat the man every day and yeah you know, we're descendants of abraham and isaac and jacob we're covenant people we reserve uh, observe all the sacrifices and we are faithful people hard hearts come on you know but they really didn't care anymore their sensory system had failed them uh, they were no longer filled with joy when God was filled with joy. They were no longer hurting when God hurt. And they were apathetic because they just couldn't feel or smell or taste or hear the things of God anymore. So when God said, okay, you're going to die out here in the wilderness. You're not going into the promised land. You're not going to go to, to this place that I want to give you. They really didn't care. It's like, eh, so what? The reason that they developed their hardened heart towards God and they became insensitive and apathetic to his voice was because they didn't do what God told them to do. He said, trust me, let me prove you faithful. I want to give you so much. I want to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what I want to do for you. And they said, well, we don't really like the way that you're leading up to that. 
God says, I want to prove you faithful out here in the wilderness. You can't just walk from slavery, you see, into the promised land. I want to prove you. You need to grow by faith. And they said, we don't really like this, the way that you're doing this. We want to run our own lives. We think that we have better ideas than you do, God. You're all right. But we really think that we need to be in control. And slowly, day by day of disobedience, they heard less and they cared less. And they became apathetic. They had seen the ten plagues. Remember, they had gone through the Red Sea and yet they didn't care anymore. And so they just died out there in the wilderness because they didn't care. Now, another word for apathy in the hard heart syndrome is calloused. Um, calloused, as you know, is the thickening of a skin in order to prevent you from feeling the pain anymore. Um, most of us have calluses in different places. Uh, you might have some on your feet. Um, if you don't wear shoes a lot, you're going to develop calluses on the bottom of your feet. I used to have calluses on my hands uh, when I was uh, younger and, and worked manually. and I still develop them on occasion, but to be callous means that we build up a resistance to the pain. So it doesn't hurt as much anymore. And we're unable to really, we're able then, excuse me, to function in the midst of the pain. Uh, we no longer feel the pressure. Well, the world system, in the world system, calluses are a good thing. You need some calluses if you're going to play by the system of this world. People want to develop thick skin, so we say, so they can get by and they don't care so much. People who, who deal with death a lot uh, will oftentimes kind of develop out of necessity some calluses. Okay, I was uh, a uh, chaplain when I was in seminary here at Central Baptist Hospital for a semester. And man, it tore me up. And, and I remember hearing the jokes that the, some of the nurses were telling and some of the other chaplains were telling and even some of the, probably shouldn't tell you this, but some of the surgeons were telling in the operating room. It's like, how can you guys tell those jokes? You know, and it's because that was their coping mechanism and they had become callous. This is how they protected themselves. And I, I just couldn't do it. You know, I'm not knocking them. I, thank God we have them. But in the course of that semester, I lost all the skin on my hands and my feet. I didn't develop thick skin, but it just kind of destroyed me. You know, and I said, I'm not going to do this. I got to find something else to do. In business, there's the saying, oh, it's not personal, it's just business, right? We hear that all the time. We, we do that. That's said when, when they call you into the office to let you go, he says, no, this isn't personal. This is just business. And that's one of the calluses that we develop to get along. But we know that no matter how many times that they say it, it's always personal. When somebody steals your account, it's personal. It's never anything but personal, okay? So how do we keep our sensitivity to God and prevent developing a hard heart or a thick skin? Well, there's just one way here, one word, and I've already told you part of it, and that is obey. Uh, this word, obey, I know we don't like to hear this, but the word has some bad press, probably goes back to some parental messages and kind of makes us feel like little children when the preacher says, you need to obey God. But the, the, the Hebrew word that's translated obey has two parts to it. And the first part means that you physically hear, that you are listening, and the second part is that you act. We hear and we act. The Israelites in the wilderness didn't listen. And they didn't act, either one. Obedience is, is first, involves the physical hearing that inspires us. Okay? And the belief or the trust that motivates us uh, to, to the hearer or to act in accordance with the speaker's desires. So first we hear, but then we're motivated, we're inspired to do what the person speaking tells us. 
And to kind of illustrate this, I, I think of a, a common scenario that, that's played out in every home in America uh, with small children, you know, and it, this is just one example, but um, a parent tells the child something like, um, pick up your plate off the table and take it to the sink. And the child's already left the table and, you know, gone to play with a toy in the floor. And the parent says, I'll come back, pick up your, your plate and take it to the sink and nothing happens. So the second time around, the parent thinks, well, obviously he didn't hear me. So what do you say? Did you hear me? Right? Pick up the plate and take it to the sink, would you? And again, nothing happens. So things kind of start to heat up in this, in this uh, drama. And so the parent says, I'm only going to tell you one more time. And the kid thinks, that's good. I don't want to listen to this anymore, you know. But I'm only going to tell you one more time. Take your plate to the sink. And again, no action. Child just continues to play with the toys. So now there's this huge decision in the balance, right? Threats are made. Uh, hostages are taken. Toys are taken as hostage, usually. Voices are raised. And some of that might work sometimes. But even if it does work, even if threats and hostages and yelling uh, works, it doesn't make the child obedient, you see, because motivation doesn't include fear here towards the one that's speaking. The child is not inspired that the mother or the father actually knows what's best for their well-being and the well-being of the family and that picking up your plate will mean that there's not plates there next, next uh, time that you go to eat. And unless they're motivated, unless they're convinced that you are right and that you have goodwill towards them, okay, that you know more about dirty dishes and, and you know, stinking food on the, on the table, unless they are convinced of that, they're not going to become obedient. Matter of fact, as time goes by, they're just going to stick earbuds in their ear and they're not even going to hear you anymore. And what this turns into as a parent uh, I, can, I can witness to is that with earbuds in their ear, you still tell them, pick up the plates, but then they don't hear you and they don't obey either one. So you get into this drama where you say, pick up your plate and put it in the sink and then you do it because you don't like dirty plates on the sink. And if the child doesn't learn that, at some point, you see he, or see, he or she no longer hears you. They become completely insensitive to what you want, to your goodwill directed towards them. He becomes indif indifferent and apathetic, and he loses sensitivity. So, so you just have this routine of every night after dinner that you yell a little bit and then put the, 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 sink, the plates in the sink is what happens. And if we are to abide, we want to abide in Christ, remain in Christ, obedience is vital to our retaining our sensitivity because if we hear and we do not obey, if we hear and we do not become inspired and motivated based on our love for God and the fact that He knows more about things than what we do, in time we become insensitive and we lose our ability to hear. 1994, South African photojournalist Kevin Carter won the Pulitzer Prize, the top prize that any, any journalist, photojournalist could win. And the photograph that brought him fame depicted an emaciated Sudanese child. They had a terrible, um, you know, terrible lack of food there uh, at that time. And the child was crawling towards the feeding center. And behind him was the hard stare of a nearby vulture. And the image, as you can see, is so powerful. And it just captures the horror of what it must be to live there. And it drew international attention to, to both the, the suffering in the Sudan and to Kevin Carter's career. But, but with the, the, the fame and the fortune came the questions. And people wanted to know. They started to ask him. They said, what happened to that little child? And after snapping his camera, what had Carter done to help the dying child? And painfully, he admitted that after spending about 20 minutes framing the shot and getting the shot, he simply just walked away. 
within two months of receiving journalism's most coveted award, the 33-year-old photojournalist took his own life. You see, he had been raised in a strong Christian home, but he had long since left that upbringing, and now he had seen so much of the world's suffering that, that he could no longer cope. And he parked his pickup truck near a place where he had played as a child and took a hose to the exhaust pipe and breathed in the fumes. And he left a note, and the note said, I'm really, really sorry. It says, the pain of life overrides the joy to the point that joy does not exist. Remember David's prayer, restore to me the joy of my salvation. What a sad story this is. I mean, it's just, just so sad. But, but the reality remains that we can lose our sensitivity to God's voice and become apathetic in the same way that this man lost his sensitivity and became apathetic. We, we, can, we can lose our sensitivity if he speaks to us and we do not obey. And his voice becomes just increasingly more distant. So he says, obey. Today, if God is telling you to do something, do it. Not tomorrow, but do it today. Today, you hear his voice. Today is the time for action. The longer that you delay, the weaker that voice becomes. Because there is a season of sensitivity. I really believe this. There's a certain timing to this. As I said in the beginning, we are either growing in our sensitivity or we are diminishing in our ability to hear God. And no matter what people might tell you about your gifts, let me, let me state this again, that every one of us has the capacity and the ability to hear God's voice. Not just those who are gifted in this, but all of us can hear God's voice. Remember Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John 10, 27. So as we close here, I want you just to listen to just three scriptures that I want to, want to read for you. They're all three from the Old Testament. And they all three make the same point. From Deuteronomy 4, 29. God says, From there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see the pattern there? And then lastly, from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 6, he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You see that time factor there? While he is near, now, obviously, God doesn't leave us. But there are seasons when it seems that God's voice is more easily heard and we are more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And God says, when I'm near, come closer. You see, when, when you sense that I'm, that I'm speaking to you, don't settle for standing still, but come closer to me at this time. And, and earlier in this series, remember, we talked about the rhythm of life and how, how God has a rhythm and he's designed life so that there's a rhythm for us of work and rest and abiding and producing fruit and being pruned. And there's a season to everything. And it will seem to you at times as if you might have lost your sensitivity to God that you do not hear or see as he does. And there will be other times when you are extremely sensitive. And there will be times when it seems that God is near and other times you will not feel that way. And all those times, he says, seek me. But especially when you s discern that I am near to you. When I come close to you, come closer to me at that time. Today, if you're sensing God is close to you, I implore you, do what he says. This is the season for you. Amen. Thirsty.
ti Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out